and I'm here with Jeff Harris of Reference Analog out of Moore, Oklahoma. I've read about different stylus shapes, and I know we talked about this before, mm -hmm. but I'm just curious, what, what's the difference? You know, there's, there's diamond and then there is conular, and then with the diamond, there's different types of diamonds. Yeah. How deep into the groove, you know, the like so the either there's ones that stop like there and there's ones that go on down. And so it it kind of different stylish shapes go into the groove differently and track on different areas of the sidewall. I know that we've kind of discussed the 12 inch thing versus nine inch thing, and I assume that's kind of the next area that you'd lead to from this. So I'll just kind of jump into that. Okay. Um, this is a 10 inch arm uh, on the, the VPI Prime. Um, they have 12 inch arms on their, their upper end tables and nine inch arms as you go kind of down the way. The only accurate spot, if we're looking at a straight line, the only accurate spot is about there. And so as I come across, I'm not, I'm not, I've got tons of distortion over here with this short of a turn arm. Um, I'm accurate, I'm less accurate, less accurate. Like a particular type of phono preamp that you recommend? Um, a capable one. A capable one? <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, there's different brands out there, there's different stuff. Um, you know, there's a lot of good, um, um, there's a lot of good phono stages in general. It kind of depends on what your budget is, what you're looking for. You know, I'm a big fan of tubes. I, I think tubes have like a holographic sound that you know, is a super lifelike, you know, presentation. Yeah, and I love tubes. Yeah, for me, the my entire goal in setting up a system, um, if the guy just says, I want it to sound real, you know, that is my goal in my system and my goal in what I, you know, put together if, uh, if that's the customer's goal, obviously, but is I like to have the most lifelike presentation. Um, you know, and with that, with, with high-end equipment, you're generally still going to hear that, you know, foot pedal squeak on a bass drum, you know, and stuff like that. If it's in the recording, you're still going to hear it. Um, but I want it to have a richness that is lifelike. So, you know, it, when Ella's singing, you know, you want to be able to have that, that, that weight to her voice. And, you know, and that, that I feel like analog and and tubes generally kind of do. They bring <laughs> so, out of the music. Right, yeah. they bring that out of the music. And so that's why I'm a big fan of, of you know, those technologies. But Do you think it makes a big difference or even a small difference if, say, you have a preamp that has tubes, but your phono preamp is solid state or your phono preamp is tube? Like you say you're running a phono preamp that has tubes and the preamp has tubes versus the phono preamp being solid state. Um, so I think it kind of comes down to the designer, what the designers were after. Um, I've heard great examples of, of mixed systems where, you know, there's some tube, some solid state, and, uh, you know, I've heard great examples of, you know, some that are completely solid state. Generally, they don't quite do what the tube systems do, but yeah. they're, you know, they're really good in their own rights. Um, and then there's full tube systems. And the biggest thing with full tube systems is that there's a little bit more maintenance because when you've got a, some tube noise going on, you gotta kinda track it down. And there's a few techniques that you can do to, to narrow it down pretty easily to a specific component, but um, nevertheless, there's some tube maintenance that goes into play. So sometimes I think that that's one reason why people like to mix because solid state's a lot easier to care for and uh, you, there's no you know no hassle you know to it. There's um, you know, no, no real maintenance other than, you know, possibly replacing the caps, you know, in 20 years down the road or whatever. Yeah, I've had to deal um, with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but, you know, some people think that, that a full tube system can be too much of a good thing and that's not, you know, that's not really reality. Uh, if, if they ever, you know, want to hear a full tube system, they can come, you know, to reference analog and hear it. Um, that uh, they can sound remarkable in any which way. Um, I'm not a big, like, uh, you know, this kind of merges into sideways, I guess, but I'm not a big uh, single-ended, you know, RCA versus balance XLR guy um, as far as, oh, you know, it's gotta be XLR, it's gotta be balanced, or oh, it's gotta be single-ended. Um, I think that for me, that's where talking about the designer comes into play. Um, 
if the designer is a single-ended believer and that's what he designs around, he's going to do a phenomenal job on that, you know, single-ended realm. If the designer is completely balanced and only believes in balanced and that's all he puts on his components, it's going to be a great balanced piece, you know, <laughs> but that's not going to necessarily dictate that the balanced piece is going to be better than the single-ended piece. Um, I feel like whatever the designers are best at, that's where their strength lies. And so, you know, those components are going to be the best of their examples. Um, so when, you know, some people I know have read that, oh, balanced is always better. And that I, ne I don't feel like that's necessarily the case. I think it kind of comes down to, like I was saying, the designer's goals and what they feel best at. Um, and that kind of goes with, with everything. Um, you know, when, when DSD first kind of hit the, the, the table, um, you know, people were saying they hated DSD and people were saying that, you know, they hated PCM in comparison to DSD. And, uh, you know, what I kind of found is that it kind of came back to the designer. If the designer didn't believe in DSD, his DSD product was not going to sound great, you know? And if the designer, you know, was completely 100% on board with DSD, that's probably going to sound great on his product, you know? And so I think that uh, a lot of this stuff comes down to the designers and what they're best at and sticking to their capabilities. And, uh, you know, so. Yeah, it's you like know. you wouldn't go to a, you know, a seafood restaurant or a steak, right? Right. Yeah. I get that. But it doesn't mean that seafood or steak are necessarily better than the other, you know? <laughs> so yeah, it's all, it all kinda, depends on the person's preference. It all depends on the person's preference. And, uh, you know, and that's where somebody like me comes in is we can kind of help work through what you're wanting at what budget and what you want it to sound like. And, you know, we can go over the different type of components. And, and uh, you know, I spend hours on the phone with people. I think that's a big difference between me and some of the other, you know, companies as I, I try to go through the effort to to really make you happy at the end of the, the game. Um, I jokingly told a customer uh, a few weeks ago when I was doing a setup, he, we put a new component in and he was like, oh man, you're right, this does sound excellent. And I said, well, I try not to lie to people because eventually they're gonna hear it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, and as soon as they hear it, they'll either know that I'm a liar or they'll know that I was right. You know, So I try to be as honest as I can when I'm describing the equipment and what to expect from it. And, you know, that way I don't make a liar out of myself whenever they eventually hear it. Yeah, because eventually, so. you know, the sound of the system will tell, right? right. Eventually they're going to sit down in front of it and it's going to play. And whatever you told them it was going to sound like, if that doesn't come out, they're going to go, dude. <laughs> what know? are you talking about? Right. <laughs> so I try to be as uh, straightforward as I can with people and try to give them, you know, an accurate opinion of, of what things are going to do in their system and how it's going to sound. So. Yeah. So still on the subject of cartridges, I've read about different stylus shapes, and I know we talked about this before, mm -hmm. but I'm just curious, what was the difference? You know, there's there's diamond, and then there is conular, and then with the diamond, there's different types of diamonds, yeah. like the Shibata. And right, without necessarily going into like, all the different exact types, um, you know, the, the different types and stuff, you know, there's, there's graphs online and I'm sure that I can email you one and you can stick it in the video or something, but there's graphs online that show how deep into the groove, you know, the, like, so the either there's ones that stop like there and there's ones that go on down. And so it, it kind of different stylish shapes go into the groove differently and track on different areas of the sidewalls and kind of some dig deeper, some skate a little higher. And so the ones that skate a little higher, you might not get as much surface noise with. So if you're predominantly listening to, you know, a classic collection that has a little bit of rough edges to it, you know, then you might prefer a, you know, conical type, type stylus that is going to skate a little bit higher and, uh, you know, not pick up all those imperfections, you know, of the dirt and stuff that's a little bit left over the years right. um, in the bottom of the groove. And so, you know, depending on what you want, it kind of dictates a little bit of stylus uh, choice too. And then, uh, you know, if you're predominantly listening to audiophile type records that are, you know, pristine and have the lowest noise floors possible and record, you know, current, you know, possi possibility with records or, um, then you might want one of the digger deeping, you know, sharper angle type type styluses that dig deeper in the groove and you can capture more detail and, and everything else. But you got to take a little bit more time and set up and, um, you know, because 
the more exacting it is, the more exacting your setup's got to be. And so, um, you know, those kind of factors come into play on your choice. But so basically, if you have a lot of scratchy records, get a moving magnet with a conular stylus, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, well, you know, I guess you can look at it that way. Yeah. And if you want it to pick up every single thing, get get a moving quill low output with a Shibata yeah, diamond Yeah, there stylus. you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm learning so much. <laughs> but yeah, you know, so there's different uh, there's different technologies and different concepts for what you're trying to do, and yeah, you know, and and uh, you know. It's, it's all about kind of matching what your expectations and desires are, so. So what, what about tone arms? Is there a difference between more expensive tone arms and less expensive tone arms, and why do they get more expensive? Yeah, so, you know, part of the expense comes with the engineering of them, and uh, some of the smaller companies, um, they've only got, you know, a dozen employees, and so you're taking a lot of time from each people, or each person. Um, you know, and there's factories that just stamp out tone arms. And so, you know, if you're buying it from a stamped out perspective, they can stamp out a hundred in the time that um, triplanar, you know, does one. And so it kind of comes down to that, but also the more expensive the tone arm, generally the more setup capabilities you have. And these have to be rock solid at the end of the setup. So everything's got to be tight and accurate and not change as it goes, you know. Um, so you've got to engineer ways that you can change all these settings, but still keep them locked, you know, locked together. So there's no vibration in the parts as it, you know, tries to trace the groove. Um, you know, vibration is distortion in anything that's not coming from the record. So um, you don't want uh, a cheaply built system, you know, and uh, with the setup, you know, some of them don't offer VTA, some of them don't offer azimuth, some of them, you know, you've got different different setup factors that come into setting up a tone arm. And uh, the higher end tone arms, generally, they took a lot of R&D time to come up with the materials and the thicknesses and the lengths and everything else. Yeah. Um, and the wiring that they use, you know, I mean, they use uh, different tone arms, use different wiring that you know, whether you're a wire guy or not. I, I personally am, I've heard a lot of wire differences uh, with cabling. And so, you know, the uh, depending on what type of wire they use can dictate, you know, also a little bit of expense. But, um, so yeah, there is, there is a reason why the cost goes up in some of the tone arms that are out there. Um, and, uh, and then I know that we've kind of discussed the 12 inch thing versus nine inch thing. And I assume that's kind of the next area that you'd lead to from this. So I'll just kind of jump into that. Okay. Um, this is a 10 inch arm uh, on the, the VPI Prime. Um, they have 12 inch arms on their, their upper end tables and nine inch arms as you go kind of down the line. And then there's some tone arms uh, out there that they, they only do like nine inch. And you know, some there's 14 inch arms out there. Um, the the catch is is how it traces across you know the platter so if and I, I did this with you the other day but i feel like it's a great example um if you think about this as a straight line because that's how it was cut um a straight line and you're trying to trace that straight line if you take your finger and you just kind of draw across the straight line there's a pretty good arch so it's super short tone arm so with that arch the only accurate spot if we're looking at a straight line, the only accurate spot is about there. And so as I come across, I'm not, I'm not, I've got tons of distortion over here with this short of a tone arm. Um, I'm accurate, I'm less accurate, less accurate, less accurate, not accurate at all. Um, if I use a really long tone arm, my entire arm, and I trace across, I can almost go in a straight line right there. And that's pretty much the reason why there's you know, less distortion in the longer tone arms. The catch with the longer tone arms versus short tone arms is generally the short tone arms have a little bit more punch and a little bit more dynamic. Whereas the longer the tone arm, it's a little bit smoother and a little bit more accurate for, um, you know, just the example I just showed, lack of distortion and, and, tra and tracing correctly. The, uh, the cavet is also the shorter the tone arm, the stiffer that the tone arm can be and the uh, less resonance and all that kind of stuff that they have to deal with. And so you're dealing with stiffness, weight, and resonance. And uh, so the longer tone arms, they have to come up with ways to stiffen and you know 
all of those things as they get longer and the shorter tone arms don't have as much problem with it but they don't track as 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 uh, linearly i guess so so why not go know. with a linear tracking turntable instead then if, if there's no tracking error say if it's going linearly across the vinyl whereas with with the uh with the with other the pivoting, type yeah, with tone, the pivoting arm. tone arm you're you yeah, having so, to get a longer a longer tone arm just to get it to right. be more perfect so the deal with that is I'll show you on this this tone arm. I've got it hooked up, but I'm going to lift it up to show you. This is a unipivot tone arm, and are you able to see it in the video from where it's at? Yes. Okay. If you look, there's basically a pivot, just a super fine point, you know, that the the arm is sitting on. So this is a unipivot type arm. I'm kind of trying to give you a backstop so you can see it a little easier. And inside, there's a little cup. And so that spike goes into that cup. So the only actual friction point, the only spot that this bearing is moving in is on that, the tip of that spike. And so there is no friction or chatter involved in this type of tone arm. I see. So the, uh, at w with a linear tracking arm, um, it's difficult to do right is the catch so as it comes across and uh you know michael frimer i know has kind of commented on this kind of stuff in his videos and this is kind of where i picked that up at so there you go a little shout out to frimer but the uh as the arm comes across it actually kind of walks with a linear tracking if it's not a really high you know level tone arm which actually makes the the stylus, as he you know, kind of said in his video, kind of do circles as it comes across because the arm is walking across. And it's on a very fine level, but when you're dealing with, with cartridges and setup, you know, you're going to extremely high, you know, high degrees of effort to get it exacting. And so, you know, with that in mind, that walking it is distorting the whole time. You know, you're you're never getting the null points where it's perfect. Um, and then with linear tracking with like the air suspension, as, as Michael kind of pointed out, you know, at some point that air has to equalize and where it does, it's, you know, as he points out, it's like a balloon that goes, you yeah. know? And so the, the issue is not necessarily the concept of linear tracking. Um, the concept is solid. The, the, the problem is implementation. Um, with a, you know, pivoting top style tone arm, excuse me, uh, with a pivoting style tone arm, the uh, there is no chatter and no friction, and so if you can get it to where you're you're tracking accurately through most of the record, which is the goal, um, then you know there's very little distortion involved. So it's kind of the the easiest way to do things right. 